Psalm 37, 1 through 6. Of David. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Psalm 37, verses 1 through 6. Oh, 
Yes, draw us near, Lord, this morning as we worship. I have quite a few announcements. The first announcement I have, there was no bulletin. <laughs> but I think everybody's aware of that. <laughs> okay. We need to remember the Moyer family. As their baby was born December 31st, and was a heavyweight, one pound, 13 ounces. <laughs> so let's remember them. Uh, they're going to remain in the NIC unit until probably April, the baby is at least. And uh, Jordan should get uh, released by uh, Monday. But I think her plan is to stay down there in one of the hospitality houses so that she might be close to her baby. So let's remember them. Also, Gloria Yetal's son, Mike, has COVID. And uh, Dan, that's uh, another son, has uh, heart issues. So let's remember them. I'm sure Gloria is very concerned for those two sons. Kim Brooks' dad is in to have a pacemaker put in, and that's going to happen tomorrow. So let's remember Kim and her family and her dad as he goes in for surgery tomorrow. Uh, Gentry's going in Monday for a vocal cord test. So let's remember him as he does that. Hopefully they'll find what's going on and be able to correct that with procedures and a little healing time. Susan Ray's uh, friend, which is Bill and Joyce's daughter, Susan Ray, is uh, in the hospital with COVID and uh, COVID symptoms. And uh, even though he tested negative, so remember that you can be with symptoms and still test negative. Our daughter Amy's friend uh, her father is in, father-in-law is in the hospital with COVID. 
No, he was in the hospital with COVID and was sent home to hospice. Uh, Jeff, Marsha's husband, is home from the hospital after having double pneumonia. So let's remember them also. And Bill, uh, Gentry's neighbor, has hospice in, so let's remember him. And remember the Peterson family and the passing of Bill Peterson, another uh, a cousin of uh, Gentry's. We need to remember Emily and Ron as they both have COVID, and that's uh, Denise's cousin. So let's remember them also. And some dates to remember. Friends and family movie night on the 15th. The 17th is our potluck, if everything holds true. <laughs> the 19th is a secret sister revealing. And that's going to be at the Busage's house. Okay. And there will all be also be some planning at Susan's house for what? Okay, for the this year's activities and probably Secret Sister again. And that's on the 19th. The 21st, there will be an elders and deacons meeting here at the building at 7 o'clock. And on the 23rd is our annual breakfast meeting where we discuss the budget for the year and, and uh, have something to eat. So everybody's invited to be there. That'll be 9 o'clock on the 23rd. So that's an important meeting we need to hold once a year to keep legal with the state and also to, to get our budget in line. I don't have anything further, so let's go to our Father in prayer at this time. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this day that we have to come and worship you. We thank you, Father, for the night's rest that we've had so that we could be here this morning. We pray that you will be with us as we've gathered here, that we can do and say the things that are in accordance with your will and your word, Father. Bless us as we worship you this morning. We pray that our worship is acceptable to you. We thank you, Father, for all the many blessings you shower upon us, for giving us life itself, but more importantly, giving us salvation. So when this life is over, we will be with you in heaven. We pray, Father, that you'll be with this congregation as we reach out to others, that many can hear the word and Many can decide to follow your word and your way and also have that home in heaven. We pray that you'll be with all of these that have been mentioned this morning that are sick and hurting and facing tests and operations. That you'll bless each and every one, Father, and bless the medical teams that will be working with them. That they can do the very best make the right decisions. Now we ask you to forgive us when we sin, Father, for we know that we are not perfect. We do sin. Help us to learn from those mistakes that we might turn away from them and live closer to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
of us could uh, have a garden out there next to his. And, uh, we had a lot of interaction with uh, John. But in the note, she told us that David had passed away from COVID on November 18th. Last night when we got home, I went down to the Walmart shopping and had a call from song is uh, 197. 197. Have thine own way.
gathered here this morning on the first day of the week that we might remember Jesus and what he has done for us. As the song just that we just sung points out, he gave his all. He went to the cross for us. What great love that is. A love that's hard to comprehend. It's far beyond the love that we know. But Jesus did as the Father asked him to go to the cross to bear our sins that we might have forgiveness. We partake of this fruit of the vine and unleavened bread each Sunday morning as the scriptures tell us, that we might remember what Jesus has done for us. At this time, we have the opportunity to partake of the unleavened bread that represents the body of Christ. We ask that you bow as Dave leads us in the prayer for the bread. Dear Lord, It's it's with a a cheerful and a sad heart that we think about your son, his his love for us, sadness of his sacrifice. We're glad for that that we partake in this bread. Let us take it in a manner pleasing unto you. In Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. We also partake of the cup, the fruit of the vine, remembering that Jesus shed his blood willingly for our sins. Let's bow as we give thanks. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your love that you would give your son to die on the cross for our sins, that we might have life. We pray that you'll be with each one of us this morning, that we can remember, that we can partake of this cup in a manner pleasing to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
take this time as part of our worship to give back what we've been blessed with so that the work can continue here to spread the word to this community and to around our area through Facebook. It takes money, it takes our support. We pray that we can all give as we've prospered and with a cheerful heart at the start of this new year. Let's bow as Dave leads us in prayer for the offering. Lord, we know we can never repay you for all your blessings. But let us let us give with a cheerful heart what we've set aside to help spread your word, to do your works, to show the world what your love is. In Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen.
right, good morning, saints. Let's see, news. The Moyers had a baby. That's exciting. Need more babies. Yeah, that's, that's what my wife says too. She's like, we're done. Okay. Can't argue, I suppose. Other announcements. So yeah, pray for pray for hope. She's uh I mean medical science can do wonders, but she's gonna have so many struggles and hurdles to overcome because she's so early. So yeah, pray for that little one. Oh, if you don't have my cell phone number, you need to make sure you get it because my landline is going to be going away. You can't reach me that way anymore. This phone number, my cell phone, is available to anybody and everybody. So it's on uh, the bulletins, which we don't have for the second week in a row. <laughs> but it's on the Internet. I have no problems with strangers calling me. I get all sorts of strangers from India calling me. I like ones who speak English more. <laughs> 989-305-2721. That's my phone number. You're welcome to call me. Text me. Uh, that's there. My landline phone is going away, so don't be calling that anymore. That's that announcement. I want to talk about trust. Now, this is uh, a, a uh, I've worked on this sermon through this last week, and uh, one of the one of the things that I worked on through this last week is is how I wanted to approach uh, your trust for me, my trust for you, how we trust individually each other as people, because honestly, we don't. We trust each other somewhat in some ways. And as we get to know each other, we trust each other more. And as we build our relationships with each other, we trust each other more. And as, as time goes on, more trust builds more trust, builds more trust. We're used to that. And, and I wrote this sermon around the concept or the idea that, that uh, I want you to trust more. And so I was going to use myself as the example. And uh, this morning I woke up at five. I don't sleep well, for those of you that don't know. If you see me on the internet at odd hours, it's because I'm not sleeping. <laughs> um, and I thought about my sermon this morning. And I, I don't know if Bill's in the habit of, I'm not in the habit of doing this. I know I, that I've done it. And I did it this morning, and that was made a realization, and I thought, I don't, we as Christians, we're to trust each other, but I don't want you to trust me. I want you to trust Jesus. So this morning at 5, this morning, 6 o'clock this morning, as I was going over my sermon and getting ready for this this morning, as I was preparing, I had to take pretty much all of my sermon that I had uh, prepared during this last week and thought about and just chunk it all in the waste can. And I thought, well, I'll just use the portions of the Scripture that I want to use because what I want you to do is not trust me. I want you to trust Jesus. And so I took out all of my me stuff, left the Jesus stuff, and then as I walked diesel uh, before we came here to service, so I had about an hour, I was going over the sermon in my mind, what was left of it, and I said, you know what? We'll see if they're paying attention because this material that I'm going to give you, I gave you last year towards the end of the year. This should not be new to you. If it is, it's because you missed my lesson and that's okay. Or maybe you're like me and you forget things and that's okay too. But I want to say this to you because it's not, I'm not in the habit of recycling sermons. Uh, 
but I am in the habit of changing my sermons. And as I changed mine, I just basically ran out of time to write a new one, as it were. As I thought about this one, I thought, I want us to trust Jesus. And so what th these are the, the verses that I had selected before I started throwing parts of it away. And what I want us to see is that Jesus trusts us. Even those of us that are not trustworthy. I'm talking about Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah, God in flesh. Without sin, He trusts you. That's really strange for, for us to, to comprehend, to struggle with, to think about. Look at what happens here in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. Jesus, uh, it, just read with me. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now Luke gives us the, the foreshadowing of, of Judas Iscariot, but it's not foreshadowing for Jesus, because he knows he knows that Judas is the traitor. He knows that, that Judas is going, to, uh, is going to betray Jesus. But before he gets there, look at what he does. He goes to the mountaintop. He's there up all night by himself. Well, in prayer. So he's with the Father all night. He had all night in which to choose his twelve. He had all night. To make that decision, who is the best of the best to represent me after, during and after? He chose fishermen, chose tax collectors, he chose the zealot. Do you know what the zealots were known for? They were known for assassinations of Roman soldiers. They would stab you in the back given the opportunity that's what they were known for early day terrorists and guerrilla warfare that was the zealots and Jesus chose one of those guys Jesus also chose the traitor Judas Judas is scary now he wasn't the traitor yet but Jesus knew that he would and he still chose him that's very important for us to remember if you flip over to John in chapter 6 and verse 70, you'll see that Jesus will say this about, about Judas Iscariot. Did I not choose you, the twelve? It's verse 70. And yet one of you is a devil. John writes, he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Everybody post-event says, ah, Judas is a betrayer. Judas is the guy who did the betraying. Everybody knows post-event. Jesus, pre-event, he knows. And he says, one of you will be betraying me. Now he knows exactly who this is. He's not let loose yet who this is. But he knows he chose all 12 of them. He trusts them. Even the betrayer. He trusts Peter, foot in the mouth Peter, knowing that Peter is going to deny him three times. He chose all 12 of them knowing that when he is arrested because the scripture prophesied that they will be scattered as a sheep without a shepherd. On the night of his arrest, they will flee all of them, all of them. He chose all 12. Who would you pick? I want, I want the best. I want the brightest. I want the most faithful. I want the most knowledgeable. I want the most, we want the, right?
And then we look at ourselves. And we say, does God really love me? Does God really want me in his kingdom? Does God really want me as a representative of his here on earth? Does God really want to save this guy as we look in the mirror? Let's keep going, shall we? Turn over to John 13. John 13, Jesus knew. It's amazing because when we read these stories, we, we sit there, we shake our heads, and we're like, man, can't these guys pay attention to anything? These disciples of his, oh my goodness. This is the night of the betrayal. Jesus, chapter 13, verse 1, he's washed their feet. He has, he has taken the position of the lowliest servant, the God of the towel, and, and he, has, he has washed their feet and dried them with the towel. He has become the servant. Now, I know I've got verse 21 up there. My notes say verse 21, but actually, if you back up even to before that, I can do that. Look at verse 18. I am not speaking of all of you, just to make sure we understand. He washed their feet, the 12, all 12, every single one, 24 feet of all of these guys. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. His heel. Jesus has washed two betraying heels. Jesus has washed two denying heels. Jesus has washed 24 fleeing heels. This night, he has washed them knowing that in a few short hours, they will be to the wind. Looking out for numero uno. I'm telling you this now, verse 19, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, verse 21, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. Who could it be? My goodness, we have no idea. One of his disciples, verse 23, and people think this is John because of the phraseology. One of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at a table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple leaned back against Jesus and said to him, oh, Mike's on this side. Lord, who is it? Right? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Oh man, I don't know, Jesus, are you sure? We don't know which one of us it's going to be. Can you imagine one of the 12? And it's, it's, it's which one? Which one of us? The answer is really that any one, any one of us could. We look at Judas and we say, man, this guy was an awful human being. <laughs> Are we beautiful? <laughs> Are we without sin? Have we never betrayed Jesus? Have we never broken the promises that we made when we were immersed into Christ? Have we never abandoned him? Have we never gone back on our word? And it's fascinating because even after he gives the morsel to Judas... Verse 27, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into Judas and Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly.
Jesus trusted Judas. He trusted him to betray him. Well, isn't that weird? Trusted him to betray him. What you're about to do, go and do quickly. Now, most of the times today, if, if we even get a hint, a smattering of, well, I, I know that this person might possibly be opposed to me, might be against me, might take advantage of me. I refuse to trust them. No one at the table, verse 28, knew why he said this to him. We read it, we're like, well, duh, <laughs> we know. That's because we got the whole story. What you're about to do, what you're going to do, do quickly. And Judas, verse 30, so after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. Didn't stop Judas a bit, did he? Jesus knew. Judas knew. And Judas knew that Jesus knew. And Jesus knew that Judas knew that Jesus knew that Judas knew. And on and on it goes. And it's just the amazing part is that Jesus still washed his feet, loved them to the last, loved him to the last. And still let him betray him. Flip with me over to the book of Acts in chapter 1. We're introduced to a man by the name of Saul. Later on, he becomes known as Paul. Yes, he wrote most of our New Testament. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. Speaking of Stephen, Stephen being the first martyr executed publicly by the Jews, being stoned to death. Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. This guy, serious, serious dedication, devotion for God. Later on, you'll learn from other texts, not only will he arrest people and take them off to prison, he will also have them executed if possible or try to get them to deny Jesus. That's this guy, this Saul, this Paul. Jump over to Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. We find that we're still talking about this guy in verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. I just think about that. This is a guy who's so zealous, so on fire for God. He's willing to go to another town, another jurisdiction, another county, another country to bring people back, to put them on trial, to have them thrown into prison, to have them put to death for being false against God. That's this Saul. That's this Paul. And while he's on his way to Damascus, while he's on his way to Damascus to persecute the church, verse 4, falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, this is after that bright light in verse 3, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, says Jesus? Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Jesus trusting a murderer, a murderer, a man who's not willing to listen to reason, a man who is willing to be extremely zealous for God. It is God first, God only, and God always. And my understanding of the scriptures is only the right understanding, yours as well. You're persecuting me, Jesus says. You're going to go to the city 
You'll be told what to do. In verse 10, now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here am I, Lord, I'm ready to serve. Jesus is speaking to me. Hallelujah, this is great. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Jude, uh, Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias, Ananias, <laughs> Ananias says, oh, wait, 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 Jesus. Wait, wait, wait. I'll, I'll do anything, but not that guy. Anything for you, but not that guy. Look at what he says. Verse 13. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Jesus says, that's right. I trust him. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Ananias knows all about this Paul, this Saul. Jesus knows all about this Saul, and Jesus still trusts him. He's still chosen by Jesus. One last verse, lesson will be yours. Hebrews chapter 7. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 23, we've been talking a little bit about priests, high priests, and how Jesus is our high priest. And that's really important, especially compared to the Judaic law of Moses. In verse 23 of chapter 7 of Hebrews, speaking of the law of Moses' priests, he says, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, speaking of Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Those former priests were always dying. They're always being needing to be replaced. You've got one priest after another. Not Jesus. He's, he lives forever. He lives forever to save only the best. That's not what he says. He saves to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Who is that? And the answer is anyone and everyone whom chooses to call on the name of the Lord. And the uttermost is fascinating because the, the, the salvation that's offered is uttermost. And there's Christians out there that struggle. Am I really saved? Can I really know that I'm saved? And the answer is, He lives to save you to the uttermost. That is, completely, totally, permanently, as long as you draw near to God. When we choose not to draw near to God, we lose our salvation. But until then, we're saved. As long as we draw near to God through Him. As long as we follow Him, He trusts us. The question is, do you trust Him? He lives to save you. There's so many people in the world, I don't know if I'm salvageable, Scott. I don't know if, if there's anything worth saving in this me. Are you alive? Jesus died to give you eternal life. Is there anything worth saving? Jesus died to give you eternal life. Do you trust him? To the uttermost, Jesus offers you salvation. This morning, if you desire that, if you trust Jesus, I would encourage you to be baptized into Jesus, to receive that salvation that He offers, to come forward this morning, to be baptized into Christ, and to be saved to the uttermost. I encourage you to come forward this morning as we stand and as we sing.
led in closing prayer by our brother Curtis. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather together, sing songs, and to hear from your word, to bring those before you who are on our heart, and to gather around the table to remember the glorious gift that you have given us through the gift of your Son, Jesus, to cover a multitude of sins. Use us, Lord, as we go out from here. Be with the travelers that they may travel safely. Guide, guard, and direct us. We go out in this community. There will be people who will be seeking, Lord, and may we have an answer. You will give us words that we need to speak that will touch their hearts, and they will understand the wonderful gift that you have given. We owe a debt we cannot pay. Pay the debt we didn't know. Till we meet again, be with us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.